family to the fifth lecture of Freedom School 3.0 Back to School. I am Dr. Lisa R. Shannon, tonight's moderator. I am a lecturer. I am the director of undergraduates for the Department of Africana Studies here at Georgia State University. More importantly, I am the colleague of our brilliant lecturer tonight. So now what I'm going to do, I'm gonna give a brief bio of Dr. Leah T. Bascom. And then afterwards, we're gonna hear from our speaker herself. After that, we will have a small question and answer period. And then from then on, we will just go ahead and enjoy our evening further. So now in the name of our creator, mother and father, all of our ancestors, we ask permission to begin this night's session. So here we go. Dr. Leah T. Bastom is an associate professor of Africana Studies and affiliated with the Institute for Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies and the Center for Latin American and Latino Studies at Georgia State University. She is trained as an interdisciplinary Black Studies scholar with emphasis in diaspora theory, cultural theory, visual culture, performance studies, gender and sexuality, and literature. Her scholarly interests focus on representations and performances of nation, gender, and sexuality across the African diaspora with an emphasis on Anglophone Caribbean. She has published in journals such as Meridians, Souls, Palimpsest, Anthurium, and the Black Scholar, and her book, her phenomenal book, In Plenty and in Time of Need, Popular Culture and the Remapping of, Barb of Barbadian Identity is part of the Critical Caribbean Studies Series at Rutgers University. Global family, I introduce to you, Dr. Leah T. Bascom. Thank you, Dr. Shannon. So I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, sharing my screen again. Okay, so we've got that going. So thank you, Dr. Shannon, for your introduction. Um, I also wanna say thank you to our colleague, Dr. Lakita Bennett-Bailey for putting this together, um, to the Department of Africana Studies and to Morris Gardner and the team at Auburn Avenue Research Library, and most especially all of you who are showing up here on a Wednesday evening digitally. Um, so what I'm presenting tonight is part of a much larger project. I wanna call it a new project, but I think I've been working on it too long to keep calling it new. And it's titled Finding Home Repeated Longings. And this project started with a question my mother posed about a piece of family land and how it came to be. So hi, mom. And I kind of been running with that question and all the other questions that have arisen for some years now. And the larger project theorizes how land ownership operates within processes of migration, belonging, and diasporic identity. And in examining how people cross national class and community boundaries, I argue that belonging is built on a fluidity that is both troubled and stabilized by the ambiguous permanency of land ownership. So what do we do with owning pieces of land, especially for people who constantly have to move, right? The project asks when populations are displaced throughout histories of forced and voluntary migrations, when people have to move, who has the right to attempt to settle and who must keep searching for a place to call home? The parts I'm gonna to share tonight focus on the story of one piece of family lands, its relationship to the island of Barbados, um, some concepts of diaspora and experiences of migration and return, right? So I'm gonna give just a brief overview situating things, and then I'm gonna break it into four parts. So part one is gonna be a bit of storytelling. Part two, I'm gonna talk about some rocks and some geological stuff. Um, Part three, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the stories around how this works and especially around migration. And then part four, we're just gonna bring it back down and have a pretty picture or two, right? So by the time we get to part four, just know that we're almost done, okay? So just as a little bit of overview, the island of Barbados is the easternmost island in the Antillean archipelago. It was colonized by the English in the early 1600s and within decades became a key site for the English gentry to try their fortunes in a burgeoning sugar trade. 
The dominance of the sugar trade went hand in hand with the importation of enslaved Africans and Barbados became a key site in the Atlantic slave trade as well. As sugar took over the island, Africans and their descendants became the overwhelming majority of the population. A propertied white minority held power and even smaller racial minorities quietly made their way into the island society. Barbados's port cities were paired with others in world trades. The slave trade tied Bridgetown um, with Charleston in South Carolina. Spitestown, where we're gonna focus mostly today, uh, traded goods with Bristol in England and was also home to a number of defensive forts. The English came to use the island as a strategic site for economic trade, military deployment, and colonial politics. By the early 19th century, the island was home to fervent abolitionists, as well as some of the most contrarian planters who had no intentions of ending the economic and social system that positioned them in power. The people of Barbados lived those battles. Fights between young planters and accused abolitionists broke out on the streets of Bridgetown. Free persons of color sought to assert their place in the politics and structure of the island society. The enslaved inserted their freedoms often in subtle ways, absconding from plantations for short and long periods, moving to the cities and being sheltered by community. An emancipation came to the British West Indies and thus Barbados in the 1830s. The power dynamics of the island would take much longer to change and the communities that lived there continued in competing with and supporting one another, everyone trying to stake out a place for themselves in the world. So part one, Old Rock. There's a small plot of land situated on the main thoroughfare of Queen Street in the port city of Spitestown, Barbados. The family who owns it calls it Old Rock. It is roughly 2,000 square feet. There's an Aki tree and a mahogany tree in the back corner. The soil is sandy as Old Rock is only separated from the sea by one property behind it. The name comes from a time when each family would name their home as a source of pride. Old Rock echoes the wishes of the butler who bought the land in the 1870s that this place would become an anchoring post for all of his heirs to come. On the 5th of March in the year of our Lord, 1873, Thomas Walter, a butler of Queen Street St. Peter on the island of Barbados bought 38 perches of land from widow Anna Margaret Perkins for 13 shillings and four pence. The deed that Walter and Perkins signed that day cemented the Walter family's rights to the land. Thomas Walter had seemingly laid a physical foundation for his family. They had a space they could call their own, an asset they could rent for income, and a legal claim to it that no person or persons could interrupt. Only decades after emancipation, this family had a piece of the rock, something of their own to hold. Having secured a place of their own to peaceably enjoy, Thomas and his wife, Mary Agnes, grew their family. Six months after Thomas Walter bought the land, the couple welcomed their second child, Edith Kathleen, into the world on September 2nd, 1873. So remember that name throughout, Edith Kathleen. The Walter family continued to grow and they continued to buy plots of land in St. Peter Barbados. The 22nd day of March, 1875, Her Majesty's courts issued a ruling that Sarah Drakes owed Christopher Smith Kidney 52 pounds, one shilling and eight pence and nearly two years and three months of interest. There's no indication that Drake's or Kidney had anything to do with the Walter family, but in order to settle the debt, the Provost Marshal Charles Tensil Hyde sold a 5,000 square foot parcel of land on Queen Street, St. Peter Barbados, and the stone dwelling house thereon to Thomas Walter for the sum of 73 pounds, 18 shillings, and one penny. This is what would become Old Rock. Thomas Walter was careful to protect his assets. He now had multiple plots in his name and a growing family to care for. Land ownership would protect the family from hard times. The family would look after the land. The two were mutually dependent. By the time he signed his will in 1877, Thomas Walter and Mary Agnes Walter had four children, Evelyn Rosmond, Edith Kathleen, John Leftis Stanley, and Archibald Stewart. Upon his death, his wife inherited one third of his properties while the remaining two thirds were to be divided amongst the children once they reached the age of 21. In 1891, the will was presented to Chief Justice Conrad Reeves and Mary Agnes Walter became the executrix of her late husband's estate. On the 3rd of January, 1899, years after her father Thomas Walter's death, Edith Kathleen Walter married a 30-year-old carpenter, Joseph Clement Jemmett, also a Queen Street St. Peter. 
By this time, she was a 25-year-old propertied seamstress. In the years that followed, they raised a family together. And in 1912, Edith Kathleen bought one rood and two perches of land, formerly a farm plantation in St. Peter Barbados. Even as a married woman, she kept some things for herself. This land was in her name alone. In 1917, upon her mother Mary Agnes's death, Edith Kathleen would become executrix of her mother's estate. Whether through her mother or her, through her father, Edith Kathleen inherited the dwelling house her father bought and the land it was upon. Old Rock now belonged to her. She was a skilled, married, propertied mother, deeply rooted in and cemented to Queen Street, St. Peter, Barbados. The people of Queen Street remember Edith Kathleen as, quote, truly just so lovely. She was short and had a humpback. It was a very nice old lady, very soft and nice old lady, end quote. Very few people remember her husband, not even his name. By the 1940s, her children were grown. Each had their own career as part of Spitestown's social fabric. One son, Clement Llewellyn, was a factory overseer. Another son, Benjamin, was a butcher. The youngest, Walter Lester, took after their mother and worked as a tailor, but helped Benjamin in the butcher shop on Fridays. In 1945, Edith Kathleen entered a deed of gift to her third son, for and in consideration of natural affection and goodwill, which I have and do bear towards my son, Walter Lester Gemmett of Queen Street, Spitestown, St. Peter, and a aforesaid island of Barbados, Taylor. An old rock passed down through the family once again. She had already deeded Clement all of her 1912 purchase and a little bit more from Queen Street in 1940. And in this family, land was a practical expression of love. The shadows of multiple histories and varying presence and presences fall across the land. Like any other space, Old Rock has held life. The rhythms of, of the city of Spitestown met the cadence of the sea in the background. The stone wall house that once stood on Old Rock was meant for a family to always have a home. It was two stories of stone that distinguished it from some of the wooden chattel houses nearby. Chattel houses provided the necessary mobility for those who did not own the land on which they built. With a small community effort, a chattel house could be deconstructed, its wooden walls removed, its wooden or zinc roof taken down, and the whole thing moved to another plot of rented land somewhere else on the island and reconstructed within a day. The people who had lived there moved on and were sometimes forgotten, but not a wall house. A wall house was made of stone. It was permanent. A wall house staked a claim to a space. It said, I'm not going anywhere, or so it would seem. In truth, there were forces that could move stone too. Unemployment, dreams of elsewhere, family ties that tug across waters could all pull people away from a wall house. And over the years, even those physical structures could eventually fall. Oops. Old Rock has seen centuries of spirits on Queen Street, heard its stories and witnessed its events. The space also holds memories. For generations, the house held a family. At another time, the house doubled at Walter Lester Gemmett's tailor shop where the men came to drink and play. And if you didn't pay on a time, a little boy would cuss you like a pirate. That tailor is gone now. The boy is now an aging man. For a brief moment, a group of Rastafarians squatted on the land before being chased out. The land is a shared asset amongst the family, but that doesn't mean outsiders can just come in. The house has long since been raised to the ground by the government who saw its decaying stone structure as a safety hazard. The family that Old Rock belongs to is spread far and wide across the island and across the world, like many Barbadian families. Many of them are still recognized in the streets of Spitestown, while others have bought their own lands, made their own spaces in faraway communities. They live a diasporic experience, making homes and seeking belonging while negotiating how to remember where they came from and not displace those where they've landed. Part two, the island. Old Rock, in name and materiality, also echoes the living dead coral rock of the island itself, secure and strong, dead and still breathing life. The island of Barbados is built out of the skeletons of coral that were formed where the sea and ocean collided. The tectonic plates beneath the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean clashed to form a ridge. Over many centuries, the sediment rose up in three stages. First, nearly 15 million years ago, the sediment of tectonic plates created shoals. 
In the second phase, nearly two and a half million years ago, a layer of reefal limestone created a bank. Finally, around 350,000 years ago, the limestone emerged creating what would become an island. Clashes of land created an environment where coral reefs formed and pushed toward the surface where they could reach the light. As one of the most diverse ecosystems on earth, coral reefs sustain a symbiotic cycle of life and death. As the coral dies, it turns to limestone. The fish turn bits of living coral into clean sand beaches. 80% of the island of Barbados is made up of the remains of once living coral. These same remains now turn to stone, naturally filter the water through the island of the nation. Filtered through limestone, it is some of the cleanest water in the world. The ecosystem moves ever outward, living and dying to continue living again. To own a piece of this living dead island is to immerse oneself in the histories that built this place. Old rock materially and figuratively represents the physical, cultural, historical, and symbolic clashes that produce Barbados. Barbados is the only island in the Caribbean to have formed in this way. At 166 square miles, the island is small compared to some of its neighbors and more than double the size of others. Its physical location is just east of the Lesser Antilles volcanic islands and positions it as a slightly protruding joint between the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. As such, Barbados figuratively articulates the histories of the new world and the old. It is situated between and within the ideas of European modernity and the resources, the raw materials, the physical labor, the people needed to make those ideas real. In both material reality and representational discourse, Barbados is a central point of understanding international relations. The island's exceptionality within Caribbean history as a coral island, as the only island to never change colonial hands and its relatively racially homogenous population make it an exception that proves the rules of Caribbean identities. Since the late 17th century, the population of Barbados has been overwhelmingly of African descent, but the migrations of indigenous Americans, South Asians, Europeans, and Middle Eastern peoples have also made lasting impacts on Barbadian life. These migrations mean that other empires, other cultures have left indelible imprints on Barbadian national identity and that the national borders of the island are always already implicated in identities that surpass nation state lines. The coral island of Barbados was formed by forces bigger than the island and impacts discourses well beyond its landed borders. Furthering diasporic theories that invite us to imagine beyond the binary where things are not either or, this work uses coral as a metaphor to highlight the way that Barbados as a coral island and diasporic identities are both produced through the simultaneity of here's and elsewhere's presences and absences, stillness and movement. And in imagining beyond the binary, I'm drawing on Bebe Clark's um, sense of diasporic literacy, right? A coral theory of diaspora draws on other non-binary theoretical tools that are based in the meetings of land and water. Kamal Brathwaite's dialectics refuse the dialectic of European thought and draw power from the practices that echo the rise and fall of tides. His dialectics connect African diasporic populations in the Caribbean through a refusal of binary thought. He says things aren't always just either or. Christina Sharp's wake work uses the ship's wake, those currents of water or air that are the afterlives of big movement, the practice of keeping watch with and over the dead, and the process of awakening as a tool to understand Black life in the aftermath of foundational and ongoing traumas. Tiffany King offers a Black shoal that she reminds us is, quote, an alternative space, always in formation, expanding or eroding, and not already overwritten or captured by the conceptual constraints of the sea or the land, end quote. A choral theory of diaspora draws on these previous theories. It is perhaps less overtly active than wake work and yet no less focused on survival and beyond. It mirrors Brathwaite's titalectics, but ties it more firmly to both the movement of the water and the stillness of the land. And rather than focus on alternative spaces as K Tiffany King does, it focuses on the tangible and intangible things that move through and exist within such spaces. A choral theory of diaspora offers a state of being and doing that can calcify histories without necessarily fixing them, the present or the future. 
all of the past sits in the choral metaphor, raw, rotting, never dead. Yet the weight of those histories does not limit the direction of any new futures. In his 1992 Nobel Prize speech, Derek Walcott posits the Caribbean as fragmented. He notes how the care it takes to put a broken vase back together outweighs the care it was shown when it was whole. What if the fragments themselves become a different kind of whole? Is it possible to learn to love the fragments and recognize the whole they once were without trying to recreate it? What if the fragments can take the vase further than the whole ever could? Such an approach to fragmentation is like how coral reefs are turned into grains of sand. It mirrors salt water meeting limestone over and over again. It shows how identity is like coral that can reproduce sexually through spawning and asexually through fragmentation. Like the people who leave the island for new worlds and those who come for new adventures, a coral theory of diaspora demonstrates how one entity can branch out into many and still be part of something whole. Such a theory of diaspora posits that the constant fragmentation makes the whole more steady and firm. Whether the fragmentation is violent, slow, intentional, forced or accidental, it allows diaspora the space to move. The choral metaphor has historically been a rich one. Art historian and curator Marion Ant Jones has outlined the ways in which choral has been used in discourses of myth, of natural history, of ecology and the arts. She notes how choral's wealth as a metaphor comes from all of the observations and the misreadings of it. Its use in Greek mythology and Shakespearean literature provides moral tales that have been refashioned in North American art like techno artist Drexia's 1997 The Quest and visual artist Alan Gallagher's 2001 The Watery Ecstatic, both of which draw on ideas of coral and um, black water and black and death. Natural history has read coral at varying times as stone, as plant, as animal, and as spiritual scientific healing balm for many ailments. Ecologically, coral environments are the most bi biodiverse. They grow in warm and cold, shallow and deep waters. Their fragmented structures are strong and delicate and exist across the world. How appropriate then is it to use coral as a metaphor for the violence and healing, the fragmentation and connectivity of diaspora? Further, using the coral island of Barbados situated as it is at the crossroads of differing geographies, histories and ideologies, allows us to concretely and figuratively build a way of understanding all the diasporic populations that exist on, have come through, and are sustained by Barbados itself. Barbados is a speck of rock risen from the crust of the earth over 15 mega annum, but it carries the much more quick and nimble, but no less heavy weight of human history. The historiography of Barbados is rich with records of colonial settlement, enslavement, flora and fauna, centuries of economic and political systems and cultural performance repertoires. History is written into the island. The older histories, those well before people inhabited the space, are written into the geomorphic structures of the island. You literally can see the layers of what happened. After inhabitation, where colonial records are absent, archeologists mine the island's caves. The water's repeated impact with the porous rock, the dead coral term limestone formed the caves and caverns. The indigenous, the ones who ran away from slavery, those outside of traditional historical structures leave their marks here in the underground. Coral allows scholars to think of the ever-changing, ever same, of moving stillness and of the synthesis of life and death. Coral is the living thing that looks like plant and stone. Coral islands are both dead and alive. They are dependent upon movement for survival and dependent on stillness for permanence. I'm using the coral island of Barbados as a material metaphor in order to understand the nuanced complexity of the diverse ecosystems of diaspora. Such ecosystems thrive on the cooperation, conflict and neutral indifference that exists within them. Using coral as a metaphor allows one to think through the here and there of diaspora, which is also a then, now, and future of diasporic thought. Unlike its mainly volcanic neighbors who erupted from the Earth's core, the island of Barbados is formed through the conflict of sea and ocean that produced land. Its tectonic beginnings produced the coral ecology that would eventually bring it above the surface. The cycle of 
animal life to limestone death, layer the island into permanence. Both the land and the marine ecosystem around it are tied to this initial violence that healed into a slow cycle of living and dying to sustain life anew. This is also a description of diasporic histories, violent clashes, survival through separation, cycles of negotiation, identification, pain, and healing that are never quite complete. Part three. Post-World War II, after the Bandung Conference, the centuries of imperialistic colonialism began to crumble. So with independence in India in 1947, Ghana in 1957, and a host of other former colonies, including Barbados, declaring independence throughout the 1960s, many populations began to identify with their new nation states and to identify across nation state boundaries with those who had experienced similar conditions of being. Diaspora became a way to name these identifications. And many of those populations are drawing on earlier uses of diaspora, specifically from Jewish, from Greek, and from Armenian populations. Founded in old traumas and built through similar, though different circumstances, the African diaspora was named. While the similarities are a foundational part of any diasporic identity, a host of scholars from Jacqueline Nassie Brown to Tina Camps to Brent Hayes Edwards to Sadia Hartman have cautioned that the differences between diasporic populations matter just as much. These differences exist both within the new nation states and across boundaries. They had been named in the novels of those who had experienced them before the African diaspora itself was named. And sometimes, land ownership is what makes those differences visible. In 1953, George Lamings in The Castle of My Skin presents a community undergoing rapid class, generational, and transnational changes. The characters of Ma and Pa in particular, and the tenuousness of their fixity in their community exemplifies the changing dynamics of community affiliations. A little later in 1959, Paul Marshall's Brown Girl Brownstones present several tug of war scenarios of belonging, identity, and land ownership. While the character Dighton owns land back home, land that he values, land that gives him a sense of self, his wife Scylla is intent on buying house like all of the other Barbadian immigrants to New York aspire to do. How might these authors' seminal works express the complexities of the African diaspora and Barbadian migration, the burdens of freedom, the conflicting goals of fixity and movement? What does an examination of land stories and land moments add to the already complex discourse of what Lissant tells us is rootedness versus relation? So in 1953, George Lamming um, published his first novel and it became one of the first novels written by a Barbadian to be taught in the Caribbean. He published it after moving abroad and it's in the castle of my skin, right? It's a semi-autobiographical novel, the main, protagonist is named G. We don't know if G is George or G is somebody else or maybe a little bit of both. Um, and it's a coming of age story of the main character, but also of the village that he comes from, right? It is laden with class implications and ideas around land ownership, right? So not unlike that history I started with at the beginning of this talk, um, the village is owned by a white property, very wealthy landlord, right? But as the black middle class and the mixed race middle class grows, they begin to buy up pieces of land. But their buying up these pieces of land tends to displace a lot of the poorer people who have houses on these wealthy people's land, right? So a man comes to the village and he is part of this growing middle class and he has just bought a piece of the landlord's land and he's telling the people who live on it that you have to go, it's my land now. You know, I understand that you live here, but I need you to pack up your, your chattel house and you have about two, three weeks to do that, right? And if you need help, I'll help you, but it's my land now and you have to go, right? And so he says, few people could ever buy land. Houses were built on and houses were sold in all parts of the island at all times, but it was always different with land. These things which stretched high and low and naked under the eye, the foot, the wind, and the rain had always seemed to carry a secret buried somewhere beneath its black surface. Why did people respect land as they did? Dirt was cheap, as the villagers often said, and sand was free, but land was the land, priceless, perennial, and a symbol of some inexplicable power. 
And for this middle-class man, him finally being able to own a piece of land is him flexing his power, right? But what it does is it displaces the poorer folks who had been there for some time, right? So the selling of land represents a breaking point for the rich. And in the end, the protagonist G um, is old enough to make his own way. As a you know late teenager, he decides that he's going to work as a teacher in Trinidad. So he enters that same middle class and his opportunity um, and means of entering that is through migration, is through leaving, is through going away, is through leaving the land that he knows, right? Similarly, we have um, stories of migration in the Barbadian American Paul Marshall's Brown Girl Brownstones, which was released in 1959, right? So she starts by giving a very clear description of the brownstones and the title and how the community of immigrants sees about them in the first four pages, right? She says, the West Indians, especially the Barbadians who had never owned anything perhaps but a few poor acres in a poor land, loved the houses with the same fierce idolatry as they had the land in their obscure islands, right? So Brown Girl Brownstones is also a coming of age story for the protagonist, Selena. Both of her parents are Barbadian migrants and her coming of age is her witnessing the conflict between her parents' differing dreams, right? Both of her parents want to live well and owning something is, central to the ideas of what it means to live well, but they have competing and conflicting ideas around what that should be, what should be owned and where it should happen. So Scylla, the mother, really wants to buy a house like all the other people around her, like all the other Barbadian migrants, and she sees that as a sign of success. Once she's bought house, once she can live in her own house, once she can rent her own house, right, um, then she knows that she's made it, right? But her husband, Dighton, owns land back in Barbados. And his idea of success as a migrant is to make his money in the US and make enough money to go home, build a house, and live like a lord forever, right? That's his dream, right? And that land, knowing that it's there, is what propels him from day to day, right? That's why he's doing what he's doing, so that he can fulfill this dream later, right? And so throughout their conflict, Scylla has a very elaborate plan to get what she wants, right? And she starts this letter writing campaign and she's writing her husband's family pretending to be him, right? And just casual stuff at first, but then starts throwing some things in and you know, we need money now and we have to sell the land. Can you sell the land for me and send me the money, right? With the intention that she's gonna use that money to buy a house, to buy a brownstone in New York, right? And she's successful in this. She gets the family to sell the land and send her the money. And when Dighton finds out, right? Marshall writes, he moans, breaking inside as the dream broke. Yet as the moan tapered into a sigh, something else emerged. That sigh expressed a profound relief. It was as though Scylla, by selling the land, had unwittingly spared him the terrible onus of resting a place in life. The pretense was over. He was broken, stripped, but delivered, right? And so he saw, as, as most of what I'm talking about, um, he saw land as his place making, how does he make a place in the world? And once he no longer has that land, he becomes discombobulated. So on the one hand, he doesn't know what to do next, but on the other hand, there is no plan. There is no responsibility to any plan, right? And so he retaliates, but he also gets lost. He loses his sense of self, right? Both of these authors posit land ownership as a way to secure a place in the world whether that world be as small as a village or whether it crosses oceans and seas. The people of Barbados, the multiple populations who have inhabited the island, left, return, and cycled through the coral mass are a distinct part of the ecology. The, de the defensive forts of 17th century Spitestown reshaped the shoreline. More recently, the coral ecology is a tourist attraction. The growth of tourism in the late 20th century has both been the impetus for further seaside development and brought awareness to nature conservation efforts. Coral sits at the intersection of the most recognizable triad of Barbadian and Caribbean marketing strategy, sun, sea, and sex. Both the physical coral ecology of Barbados and its representational markets are strong, adaptive, and fragile. In the 21st century, erosion and ecological conservation meet at the coastline, echoing the representational processes of forgetting and storytelling. 
The sea has reclaimed the weight of Spice Town's cannons as they have fallen largely forgotten into the water. The construction of new ports on the Northwest coast includes barrier walls of imported slate to protect the shoreline, the coral habitat, and ports full of expensive timeshares. Such efforts show the interconnectedness between the representations of Caribbean paradise and the slow ecological processes of natural development the coral sits at the intersection of. Barbados's layers of coral rock, of life and decay, have foreshadowed the histories and futures of the lives that would come to live on and through it. The migrations of Barbadians to other islands, to Cuba, to England, to Jamaica, to other mainlands, North and South America, Europe, Africa, and to the interstitial spaces and moments like the building of the Panama Canal have spread Barbados beyond its physical land borders. The diasporic entanglements of Africa, South Asia, and the Caribbean mirror coralline reproduction, sometimes still connected, sometimes cut off, but spawning new communities elsewhere. In the crystalline blue waters of Barbados's coast, in the caves and caverns that house its history, in the spaces where rock, plant, and animal meets, perhaps we scholars can find a roadmap for how to understand the material and ideological implications of diasporic movement and stillness. Part four, almost done. Old Rock is a wish and a reality. It was meant to be a place for the Walters and then the Gemmets to call home for perpetuity. In the 1870s, Thomas Walter planted a seed that he hoped would remain fertile, growing into a wish of permanency that through time he could never quite control or enact. His daughter, Edith Kathleen, grew to be a respected woman in Spice Town. The appearance of her walking with her hunched up back never detracted from the heights of her social stature, built on her material belongings, but even more so on her reputation of kindness and quiet power. She continued her father's wishes in collecting land and passing it on. In the seven decades since Mrs. Edith Kathleen Jemmett gifted Old Rock to her son, migration has continued to be an integral part of Barbadian life. Her surviving heirs no longer live on Queen Street, but are dotted across the island with younger generations oceans away. Now, Old Rock is an empty lot. An aki tree and a mahogany tree, long ago rooted to the land, and the bushy wild grass are about all that grows in its sandy soil. The hotel behind it encroaches as the shadow of the tall building leads over the guard wall and falls where the wall house used to stand. The city of Spice Town has changed too. Only one of the five jetties that the boats used to offload still exists, and it isn't quite safe to use. Over the years, Queen Street traffic bustled more as cars became common and then quieted as the highway was built nearby and the bus routes changed, taking traffic away from what was once a busy thoroughfare. But Old Rock remains, sitting there still on Queen Street, long ago voices of children calling out for daddy to help them cross the street still echo and even longer ago whispers from a quiet woman, dark with a hunched up back, powerful and well-respected float through the land of Old Rock. The heirs of the Walter and Gemmett families have moved on, but in theory, at least, they still have a physical material place that they can come home to, if they still see it as home, if they still see themselves as connected to that history, to Thomas Walter's wish, to this land. Those who own land abroad differ, some have bought land to grow their own roots. Some have done so as a business adventure. Others have staked their belonging in a community knowing and or hoping that it's a temporary thing, that they will either return home or perhaps find or build another home. If sand can be, quote, a repository of feeling and experience of affect and history, end quote, if it can metaphysically hold memory, as Vanessa Agar Jones suggests, then what does the sandy soil of old rock remember? Perhaps, to draw again on Glissant, the land is more of a relation than a root, as this materiality might suggest. Maybe for those who come from histories of migration, for those whose homelands are built on rootlessness, the fluid contested networks of diaspora are the only home. Like many others each year, I return home to Barbados. I am welcomed, I belong, and I do not. 
I have a home there and I'm a foreigner. For years, I would take photos of Old Rock. My mother calls it daddy's land. It was her father, Walter Lester Jemmett, son of Edith Kathleen and grandson of Thomas Walter who lived there. I would take photos and send them to her so she could be assured that the land was being cared for. She doesn't need my photos anymore. She's completed her own cycle of migration and return and has settled in her own home on the island a few miles away from the family land. She's not like others from Spitestown, the population who is spread out. I gather with some of them in the water at the beach further north every morning. Some have never left the island. Some spent lives on different continents before retiring and coming home. Others are only home briefly on holiday. And we swim between two big ports in the north on the west coast where those who can afford it can park their boats and winter at their timeshares, but everybody can swim in the water. Each morning, our community of near and far swims out together. I like to swim out and sit on these coral rocks and watch the fish below. I watch people fishing from shore or heading out to their boats further out in the water. People swimming, people playing, baptisms, turtles popping up for air. I like to swim out and sit on these coral rocks each day. I like the quiet of sitting alone and watching life go by. I'm not the only one. Others swim out and sit. Some stay and chat. Some just rest and then move on. None of us own this particular spot, but it belongs to each of us. Each of us belongs there. We have a place on this dead coral rock where each day we watch the fragile ecosystem coming to life anew. Thank you. Dr. Baskin, that was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, um, it reminds me of my home and the land that's there now and the lot that was just sent to me almost mirrored your story. Um, so I ask now, we do have, um, and, I, and I see one of my brilliant students, Mr. DeCorey Thomas, he's saying Ashe. Um, so I look for questions now in the chat. If um, students, if you can go ahead and post your questions for Dr. Bascom, that would be great. And um, Morris, if you can help me with that, or Dr. Bonnet Bailey, if there are questions on Facebook, then please just um, interrupt me and let me know. So it was, thank you, Ms. George, phenomenal, phenomenal presentation. I did have a couple of questions, Dr. Bascom, that was sent um, prior to um, your, your lecture tonight. And then I had one question of my own. Um, and of course, all of your scholars are saying that great content as, as always, Dr. Bascom, your students who have you now, who have the privilege to learn from you now. One of the questions that I have for you, um, when you were going into this project, you had a sense of what you would find or discover. What surprised you, if anything? All of it. Um, so my mom wanted to know how her grandmother was able to own land in that time, right? Like, was that common? Like, how was that possible? And um, my very first time starting in the archives with this, my mom came with me and we had our own little historical adventure. And she was the one to find that initial uh, 1912 purchase of lands, right? We were very excited about this, right? And when I kept coming back, I, st I started reading that purchase over and over again. And I'm like, this is not, oh, this is not Old Rock. This is not the land that we're talking about, right? So she had lots of land, which was the first surprise, right? Um, and then just to, anybody who has had the privilege and the patience to go through archival records, you can see what's there and what's not, right? You can see the bits and pieces of history and then all the things that you have to fill in for yourself, right? So you see these names and these dates and who's there. So I can see when Edith Kathleen got married and I can see that her brother was one of the witnesses, but I don't know if they got along or what they were like, or, you know, that comes from Spitestown, that comes from family, that comes from the stories that are held, right? I was surprised, um, my uncle surprised me. There was a point where nobody could remember Edith Kathleen's husband's name. 
and mm. as a man you know where where else do i find the records i couldn't i'm like does it you know is i don't know her at the time i didn't know her um her birth name i didn't know her name from birth so my mother was talking to my uncle and he was like oh i have all that and just pulled out records from before they would have been recorded in any kind of national before it was required to, to record them in a central registry right so to have not only those stories but also those records to know the ways in which care has been taken in all of these different ways both with the memories with the records with the land itself right um i think all of that was was pleasantly surprising um yeah Phenomenal. Um, one question is coming up in the chat now from um, Tahori Thomas. Throughout this project, you took on multiple roles and new jobs, including researcher, photographer, archaeologist, interviewer, and writer. What part of this project was your favorite? I don't know that I have an answer to that one. Um, or rather, the answer might change from day to day. Um, I think it's more that the things that I do turn into projects, right? Um, most of the photos that you see here, I did not take for this project. I just, I like Barbados, it's beautiful. And so I take photos of it. And then sometimes it ends up in things that I do, right? <laughs> or, you know, there were times where, like, you know, the quotes about Edith Kathleen that comes from Mrs. Lorraine Scantleberry, who is a family friend um, who since passed. And that was a distinct interview, right? But not unlike my last projects, a lot of the conversations happen at Christmas, happen stopping by, happen at the rum shop, right? So some of those, that's just how information is shared, right? Um, and I think I love going into the archives. Um, I think I am always nervous in the archives. I have such respect for the space and for the people that work there that I'm always just like, let me not mess up. Let me remember the rules of each space and what to do and what not to do and what I've done and what I haven't done. Um, and let me not waste people's time. So I feel like that's always an adventure, but always, I don't know if it's my favorite part because it's always anxiety inducing. So it's a thing. Um, and yeah, I think as researcher that, that is the main thing, right? So I can't say that it's my favorite role, but it's the role that encompasses all the others. Um, another question that came in before, how is Barbados role in this or your subjects roles, how are they misunderstood? Mm, so I, I would say Barbados in particular, the, um, okay, two things around misunderstanding. It's a tiny island, right? The farthest you can go from one point to the other is 21 miles, and then you hit water again, right? And so perhaps understandably, perhaps not, people see it as this small place, right? But historically, it has such import, right? And even, not even just historically, in the continuing history that is today, in terms of who has, who has come through the space, where they've gone on to influence the histories of the new world. So if you, you know, a lot of people may or may not hear in high school US history, the ways in which the French Revolution and the American Revolution are tied and these ideas of liberty and this, that, and the other. Well, a lot of the language of those documents, especially on the US side, was coming from Barbadian planters, because in the early 1650s, in the middle of the English war between civil war between parliament and the monarchy, Barbados was like, leave us out of it. Like, we don't fight about that here. We're here to make our money, leave us out of it, right? Um, but what that did is that when England kept trying to say, no, you're gonna follow our laws, Barbados was like, nah, freedom, we're doing it our way. We're gonna trade with who we want to, right? And that's where a lot of those forts come from, right? In de defending the trade. So on the one hand, you have ideas of liberty and freedom coming from this world. On the other hand, that is in service of an unfree system, right? That again, becomes central and Barbados's place in it is quite central, right? So most of the enslaved Africans that came through Charleston came through Barbados first, right? So I think one misunderstanding of the island is its place in the world, right? I think that's um, very quiet in a lot of the histories and it could be much louder. I think in terms of the people, um, I'm gonna call it a misunderstanding 
Barbadians, especially when we talk about the kinds of communities that Paul Marshall is writing about in larger West Indian communities, Barbadians are seen as the arrogant ones, right? Um, we have a reputation throughout the Caribbean, again, because of uh, the British colonial system, because of where we're geographically located, we became a site for colonial administration. A lot of civil servants throughout the British West Indies were Barbadian, right? So you might have police officers in the Bahamas that look like everybody else, but you don't want them to actually have community there. So they're Barbadians that have moved in, right? And so um, there is this sense of arrogance from Barbadians, right? And I think a lot of the Barbadians I know and love, a lot of the ones that I've talked to is more a sense of pride, right? Um, and understanding, again, a place in the world. And if you understand your place in the world and somebody doesn't understand your place in the world, it's very easy to recognize that as arrogance, right? Rather than um, a sense of self. Phenomenal. Um, I applaud you for being a landowner and your mom. I, um, the one question that I kept coming when you were talking about old rock and then now knowing that this is your family ancestry, my question, my question to you is Dr. Bascom, if you place yourself, you said you do the morning swims and you go to that coral and you look out on, you know, onto people moving and everything. But what if you parallel yourself to being one of those chattel homes? Mm -hmm. And then what if someone comes in and they buy that coral rock that you sit on because you do not own it any longer and they ask you to move? How would you feel? And my next space is where would you move that chattel home? Where would you move your chattel home to on the island? So I think um, it's an easy question, although it's not easy to answer. Um, and I say it's an easy question because I am a child of migration. I am a child of diaspora. I understand what it means to be unsettled, right? And even in understanding that, I understand or rather because of understanding that, I understand the work it takes to be settled, right? Whereas folks who have long histories of being where they are and their families have been there forever and ever, they've done that work, but it may not feel like work because it becomes so normal, right? Whereas for us, and by us, I mean my family, I mean, you know, nations, I mean all of those who migrate, you know what it's like to move into a new place and have to find and make community, to have to find and make your own resources, to have to find and make space for yourself, and often to have to do it over and over again, right? And even when it comes to returning, right? Because once you've been gone, that place stays there. And this is what I mean when I talk about the permanency and the kind of moving stillness. The rock is still there, but it's not like everything is still the same. Like people have moved, people have changed, people have grown. And so even coming home to a place that is yours, even returning to you know, a site that had been settled, you still have to do it over again, right? And so there is the maintenance work of communities, of connection, of identity, on top of the always ongoing, how do I not only make a place for myself, but maintain that space? Phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal answer. Um, well, when when can we expect to get Finding Home in Coral Islands in Diaspora? When will um, this work be out? <laughs> give me a few more years. So the book has been long in coming. I started this, you know, my mother and I went to the archives before I finished my dissertation, before I was working on the first book. So um, it's been long in coming, but it's one that I think is a project that needs care and time. Um, so there's been a lot of work with uh, the Barbados National Archives. Um, I think Miss Harriet Pierce is on the line tonight over at Barbados Museum and Historical Society. And so I, I intend to do some more work over there. Um, I've been to the UK's archives, which are massive and need to do some more trips there. And I haven't begun, but I'm about to begin um, the kind of third part of the book, which is tracing the where people went, right? So I'll be headed to New York, um, looking at a lot of the, the documents of New York neighborhoods, but also the populations who moved. So, you know, 
everybody who went to Panama and some of those who stayed, some of those who came back, some of those who went to Panama and then Cuba, some of those who went to Panama and then New York, you know, those who had land back home and kept writing the letters and those who decided, no, I'm going to move here, but I'm also going to integrate this space. And so that's going to take some time. <laughs> Well, I can't, I can't wait. Your first work was phenomenal. This work, um, my scholars know, I, um, I applaud you as a researcher. I call you a brilliant scholar. I call you my colleague with pride. So I thank you. Do you have any final, you want any shout outs? I heard you just say, uh, I think Ms. Harriet, do you have any shout outs? Do you want to thank anyone for coming? Besides, of course, I can do the final thank yous to Morris and Auburn in the department, but what, what are your final thoughts? Thank you to my mom. Hi, mommy. Um, I think my uncle's on the line. Um, I'm pretty sure I saw earlier Ms. Z was around, um, you know, all the students who, you know, have always inspired me and all the colleagues who've made it today. And so, yeah, thank you everybody for, for coming tonight virtually. And to her villagers, y'all have to be proud. I'm just proud to know her. Y'all have to be proud. So as the moderator tonight, I do have to give a shout out to our very own Dr. Lakita Bonnet Bailey, um, who was the mastermind behind Freedom School. She is amazing. She's an amazing scholar herself. To our chair, our phenomenal chair, Dr. Akineli Omo. I'm sorry, Dr. Jonathan Gales is our chair. I have to get out and shout out to him. And then I also have to thank, of course, Morris there at Auburn Avenue Research Library and all of his partners, his colleagues, who make sure all of these presentations are done and done professionally. Let me go ahead and announce next week, October the 20th, we have Dr. Thaddeus Johnson of Georgia State's very own Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology. He will come to us and speak on facial recognition systems in policing and racial disparities in arrest. And our very own Dr. Lakita Bonnet Bailey, she will be the moderator next week. So thank you everyone for signing on. I wish you well. I wish you joy. I wish you staying safe. And I wish you perpetual happiness. Good night, everybody.